ages, you are about to enter the world of darkness. A world where life and death are meaningless and pain is God. Woo! Hey, fella, let's go. Yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. I think I'm smiling. Yeah, we're going to have a good time. Howdy, folks. Come on in. Try some tutti fucking fruity and my famous fried chicken. What is going on, everybody? This is Sean. I am with Strangeland Oddities. As you can see here, we are with Sid Haig. It is nice to see you again, Sid. Uh, last time I saw you was back in, I believe it was either 2009 or 2010 in Miami, Florida. Is I interviewed you and I interviewed Kane Hodder and Michael Berryman and Tony Moran. This was actually the picture for the magazine that we worked for back then. Um, I don't know if you can focus in on that. But after the interview, um, you dared me to get a tattoo. And I said, uh, all right. But you said, one condition, I have to pick the picture out. So you picked the picture out. And as it was being tattooed, you walked over and you said, man, that tattoo looks like shit. And then you said, hand me a Sharpie. And you signed it, and you said, now tattoo that, and that'll be one hell of a tattoo. Unfortunately, you had to leave before you were able to see it finished. So I just wanted to show you All right. the finished product on that. Yeah, that, see, that's one that, that I thought people would gravitate to. But you're the only one. Congratulations. Thank you. And I liked how it was not the typical Captain Spaulding tattoo. Yeah. And, you know, being with Captain Spaulding, I know a lot of fans have submitted something about the three from hell. We are not going to talk about that. We're not going to do any spoiler alerts. We're not going to get into that. Just look forward to it in the future. Now, here's a fan question. Um, what was it like being a slumber brother in the 1970s James Bond film, Diamonds Are Forever, throwing Lana Wood, who happened to be nude, off of a high-rise building? I know what I would say to it, but I'd love to hear your version. It don't get any better. <laughs> I mean, who gets to throw topless Lana Wood out of a hotel window? Come on. And then also you were in the Batman series, and I'm not talking about the Batman movies. I'm talking about the Batman series with Adam West, where you played a character where you got to blow white powder in Batman and Robin's face. Now, can you bring us back to what it was like doing the preparation for that, and what was that powder made of? I have absolutely no idea what the powder was made of. Uh, it could have been Coke. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But the way that I got the job was very unconventional. Uh, the week before, I was either guest star or featured player in every major television show every night of the week. And that was so special that I just had to take out an ad in, in Variety and, and uh, The Hollywood Reporter. And I did a quarter page ad, which was all I could afford. And uh, two or three days later, my agent got a call from Howie Horowitz, who was producing the show, and said, get Sid Haig in here right now, because he chewed out his whole casting department. He said, this guy is doing everybody's show in television except mine. Get his ass in here. And so that's how I got the job. Nice. Now, you were also offered a role in uh, Quentin Tarantino's uh, original film, Pulp Fiction, but you had to turn the role down. But you later did, um, you know, Jackie Brown and Kill Bill 2. Um, why were, did you have to turn the role for Pulp Fiction down? I had this major conversation with my agents telling them that I was really tired of doing so much television because that's just grinding it out, you know. You got to get 21 setups a day no matter what. 
uh, on and on, and it's just rush, 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 rush. No chance to develop character or anything. So I didn't want to do that. I got the script for Kill Bill, went in to do, I mean, for uh, Pulp Fiction, went in to do the uh, interview, and uh, Quentin said, you know, I've always just loved all of your work. And I said, well, good, I'm, you know, I'm glad somebody appreciates what it is that I do. He said, no, man, look around. And there were six one sheets on the, on the walls, and I was in every one of them. He made me sign one before before I left. And uh, he wanted me to do the role. I wanted to do the role. The deal came down, it was for one day. And I said, excuse me, which one of you were listening to me when I said I didn't want to do that kind of shit anymore? There's four locations involved. How are you going to do four locations in one day if it's not rush, 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 okay? Nobody bothered to tell me that Quentin doesn't work that way. If uh, the one day turns into one day, that's what it is. If the one day turns into two weeks, oh well. Nobody told me, so I turned it down. And is it true that when you were seven years old, you started performing as a dancer, and do you still dance? Uh, as long as these old bones will hold me up, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, that was that was fun. That was so much fun. I started dance classes when I was six years old because I was growing so fast that I was just totally uncoordinated. I could trip over a dime. And my parents decided that I should have dance class. So I said, okay. So I went to the dance class and I fell in love with it. I thought it was great. And then a year later I was getting paid to dance. There you go. Nothing, nothing will hook you into a business like money. So no dancing with the stars for you in the future? Nah. <laughs> now, a lot of people also don't know that you originally were a musician before you just started doing acting. Um, what made you decide to, you know, say, you know, I'm not going to do music and I'm going to move forward with the acting? Well, because... Um, we signed a contract with Keen Records um, a year after high school. Rock and roll was only four years old, okay? I have a question that I'm just going to give you the answer to because nobody's going to have it. Uh, what was the first rock and roll song that was introduced to the, to the world? Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock in a film called Blackboard Jungle. And I was, the night, I was there the night that it opened, and I was totally hooked. Now we'd call that, you know, um, folk rock or whatever, but <clears throat> that was it. And uh, so we went in, and we, co we recorded six singles for them, and uh, we were getting all kinds of radio play. The jukebox money was just coming in like crazy. And uh, we were performing on weekends because two of the band members were still in high school and, you know, can't be on tour and be in high school at the same time. Uh, parents don't like that. And uh, um, at one point we were like number four in the country. Yeah. But we weren't making any money. Okay. Okay because everything is charged against production. Okay? I was in the office when uh, my manager wrote a check out for $750 to have our song played on television one time. Uh, yeah, so that seven, a piece of that $750 was mine, but I never got it. So at the age of uh, 18, 19, uh, I decided that uh, there's no money in this. I'm busting my ass. We used to do a four-hour show, okay, and uh, not making any money. So I just walked away from it. Do you still perform at all or jam? When I have a chance, yeah. yeah. Have, have you ever jammed with, with Rob? No. No? 
Um, now, I did see uh, the latest release of Death House, which was an amazing of who's who in horror. It was a great movie. Uh, your role was great. I think Gunner would definitely would have been proud of that production. It's a shame that he wasn't able to make it through. I think the only reason that all of us did that film to begin with was because of Gunner, because of, you know we respected him and wanted to do do his work. Now you've also been a busy man filming. Um, we originally were supposed to do Back Days of the Dead in Atlanta, but you had to cancel because you were filming. Um, you know, which one of them was Death House, and you have some other ones out like uh, Cynthia, Abruptio, Junction Murders, Tabbitt's Traveling Carnival of Terror, and Frankenstein Gothic, and a bunch of others. And High on the Hog. High on the Hog. Yeah, High on the Hog I really have got a soft spot for because it's 180 degrees away from everything that I usually do. I play a farmer, and this farm has been in the family for five generations. I promised my father that I wouldn't sell out to the big corporate farmers, okay? And But things got a little tough, so uh, I just decided to start growing some weed in with the corn. And uh, that's one way to supplement my income. And. Uh, Along the way, I ran into these women that had been horribly abused in one way or another, and I just took them in as family. And so here we were, these three women and myself, uh, operating this uh, farm as a family. And, uh, and um, everything was going along great until the DEA showed up. <laughs> and then everything kind of just turned to shit, you know. But, um, yeah, I... And I, uh, I guess it's in the works that both Cynthia and uh, Ope pat on the back, which I won the Best Supporting Actor for. Nice. The IFS Film Festival. Um, uh, both uh, Cynthia and High on the Hog are scheduled for word, worldwide release. At what point? I don't know. They're in the process of doing all of that la laborious paperwork that comes at the end of every shoot, you know, just goes on and on and on. Yeah, hundreds of paper, uh, papers full of, you know, full of all kinds of stuff that nobody understands. Um, so. Now, a lot of your roles, you tend to play a bad guy. Do you enjoy playing the bad guy? Not so much anymore. I mean, it all depends on the script, you know. Uh, for me, the story is everything. I'll do a, I'll do a, a romantic comedy if the script is good, you know. Um, that's the thing that's important for me. Uh, I like doing horror for you know several reasons. One of the reasons being the fact that horror film fans are the best in the world. I mean, they're totally loyal. They just, you know, they just gravitate to you, and I'm so appreciative of that because without, you know, without them, I got nothing. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And doing conventions like this, I mean, you see how the fans swarm over to you, and they're just in love with all your characters that that you portrayed. As Bill Mosley says, it's his bodies of work and <laughs> you have tons of bodies of work yeah. and I have to say you know out of I know a lot of people are you know die hard you know going for Rob Zombie with the Captain Spaulding and stuff like that you know no we're not asking anything about Captain Spaulding because you can only ask so much about Captain Spaulding Everybody knows about Captain Spaulding. Everybody knows about Rob Zombie in the House of a Thousand Corpses, Devil's Rejects, etc. Et so, you know, I know a lot of people were submitting fan questions about Captain Spaulding. So, you know, it's you got to check out his bodies of work. His bodies of work are simply amazing, and 
you know, like you said, he can do a romantic comedy if it's a great role. Now, I was also reading something that you practiced uh, hypnotherapy and you are certified as a hypnotherapist. Yeah. Um, do you still do that? Uh, when I can, yeah, yeah. I'm the traveling hypnotherapist because I'm in town so little it would be stupid to open an office. <laughs> Okay, it'd just be this empty thing. Okay, um, so I go to people's houses. I go to, you know, I've re I've even done sessions uh, at uh, conventions. Oh, okay. Yeah, in my room. Um, but it's something that was I I really latched onto. Um, and to be able to communicate with somebody's subconscious mind at that moment uh, is is rare and uh, very rewarding. Yeah, I've always been interested in and about it. I've I've read a lot about it, but I've always thought it'd be interesting. You know, especially that I found out that you do it and. What got you interested in hypnotherapy? Well, I had always been doing a lot of homeschool work and in, in psychology to better create characters. So that was what I kind of gravitated to, but I knew I didn't have 10 years to go to school to become a psychiatrist. So uh, I found this place called the uh, Hypnosis Motivation Institute and uh, sent away for the brochures, blah, 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 saw all the stuff, filled out an application, went down, took a test. I guess they want to see if you're nuts uh, <laughs> before you start working with somebody else's head. Um, and I got classified as not being nuts and uh, <laughs> started, uh, started classes. And... In a year's time, I did over 900 hours of class study, and then past that, I did another six, seven hundred in additional study. Yeah. So I'm certified in a lot of different areas, even Chinese face reading. Oh wow. Yeah. Can you explain a little bit of the Chinese face reading for the fans that don't know what that means? Yeah, there are um, signs to look for in people's faces that will tell you a little bit about who they are. Uh, for instance, if there's like lines, but you know, under the nose, down to the lips, usually means that they're one of two things or both: a smoker or uh, a caregiver. Um, the shape of a person's nose will tell you what their economics is like. If they're a spendthrift, if they're uh, cheap, uh, if they don't mind spending money on quality merchandise. Okay, uh, there's all different things to different kinds of things to look for. And I'm also a master um, handwriting analyst. Uh, because that's all a part of the, <clears throat> I, I can't call it a treatment because California is too lazy to establish a board for sort of, you know, certification uh, for hypnotherapists or else I'd be a doctor of hypnotherapists, not a certified Dr. Hypno Sid Haig. Dr. Sid Haig, that's it, Dr. Feelgood. <laughs> uh, and... Um, but, you know, I, I just stuck with it. And it was all because in 92, I just had had enough of playing the same old parts. I mean, they were just, I was saying the same words, they just put different clothes on me. Uh -huh. And uh, I said, you know what? If you can't figure out that I got more in me to give than that, then I'm just gonna back away until somebody can click a couple of synapses together and figure out that I can do more. And that person was Quentin Tarantino when he cast me in Kill Bill. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, there's an interesting fact for you people. Now, um, 
when we talked on the phone back in December ish, um, we uh, one of the questions that someone submitted uh, it was a uh, Sherry Bravo. She was asking, you know, what the difference between television and and film was, and to just basically cut it short, so you don't have to go into the full details of it. I remember you were saying something that there's no originality. It's spit, 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 spit. You were telling me that you did one role, and then you did the same role, but you did it as a Western. Yep. And there's no creativity where with movies, there's a lot of improvision, and you can actually create the character. Yeah. So that was one of the original questions, and I figured that I'd just throw that in there, but didn't want to get too deep into it. Um Again, we're over here. We're in Charlotte. Uh, we are with Sid Haig, and we definitely thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule here because I know you're going to be swamped this weekend, and it was a pleasure seeing you again. And thank you so much, sir. Thank you. And do you have any last words for your fans? Uh, yeah. If you're passionate about something, stick with it, Okay. Winston Churchill once gave a, gave a commencement um, speech to the Howard School, which was where he went to school. And a piece of that uh, commencement exercise um, stuck with me, and it was never give in. Never, never, never give in. Okay? And never have plan B because... When things get rough, you're going to go to plan B, and then you're through, okay? Uh, nobody says, you know, well, I think I want to be a hairdresser, but if that doesn't work out, I'll be a brain surgeon. No. Your plan B is never harder than what your original goal is. If you're passionate about something, stick with it. I'll tell you, there was a time when I was going to the Pasadena Playhouse, very famous school, uh, and uh, in the kitchen in the men's dormitory, everybody had a little cubicle to put their food in and everything. And one night, one night I went in there and there was a box of rice that was always there. And I said, well, I guess tonight it's rice. And I picked it up and it was like the empty milk carton thing. And I had like a heavy tablespoon of rice. Why I kept it? I don't know. For this, pro probably for this reason. I said, well, here we go. And I swallowed the the rice and drank some warm water and waited for it to expand, but nothing was going to make me quit. All right, ladies and gentlemen, this is great. And just on a little side note, if you ever were Dr. Sid Haig and you were a therapist, I think I would definitely choose you as my therapist. All right, nice. <laughs> All right everybody, this is Sean Strangeland Audis. We are at Days of the Dead Charlotte. Thank you very much.